Hi, I'm Ethan. I love muzzleloading. Today, we're taking a trip to Kalamazoo, Michigan for the 2022 Kalamazoo Living History Show. Before we get too far into the video, I want to preface it with a lot of the filming that you're going to see here is before and after peak show hours. I'm a volunteer staff member helping out with the running of this show. So if the crowd in the video doesn't look as large as you're used to seeing, that's why. Thankfully, after the two year hiatus we saw with the Kalamazoo Living History Show, the crowd uh, reportedly, as we've heard back here now, is right on track and it is as consistent as it has been in past years. The Kalamazoo Living History Show is the largest nationally recognized juried show in the Midwest, devoted to pre-1890 original or reproduction living history supplies, accoutrements, and related crafts. More than 10,000 historic reenactors from pre-revolutionary through the Civil War, history buffs, collectors, and the general public from 18 states and Canada come together for a festive weekend to buy, sell, and trade. The event attracts over 270 of the finest craftspeople and dealers of the living history supplies and related crafts throughout the United States. Showrunners Leslie and Rick Conwell were super enthusiastic about being back. Uh, for this year after the hiatus, and I think even more so, seeing so many attendees and visitors coming in to support the vendors and craftspeople that really went through two solid years of event cancellations that really affected a lot of their personal incomes. As one of the first events that we go to here in the Midwest, um, it was really encouraging to see such a large turnout and, uh, and such a good vendor turnout as well. Pretty much across the board, Saturday was kind of a, just a busy day with everybody coming in and, and catching up and talking a lot. Uh, sales were consistent though and on par and sometimes even a little bit better than years previous for some vendors, which was great. On Sunday, the crowd felt a little bit lighter, but all the vendors I talked to said they had a better day on Sunday than they did on Saturday. Through the entire weekend, uh, everybody I talked to was just happy and excited to be back out and be back at the show. Uh, there were several attendees that came in and, and were just elated to see that the event survived. We went through, you know, the last two years was pretty hard on events and vendors and craftspeople. It's nice to see that the attendees and fans of the Kalamazoo Living History Show were so excited to see it come back after its hiatus here. Uh, I think it really kind of roared back to life, really. For those unfamiliar, this show takes place at the Kalamazoo Expo Center. 
at the 4-H Fairgrounds in Kalamazoo, Michigan. It's a really great venue for an event of this caliber and of this size. It has three large rooms set up for vendors. And I think really the best part about it is all of the entrances and exits for loading and unloading. On Friday night, the doors open for unloading and setup at 6 p.m. after a short staff meeting. And it's really incredible what you see when those doors open. Right around or just before six, vendors will line up outside getting ready to come in and get their paperwork and their table assignments. A lot of the vendors are consistent over the years and so they know their tables. They're just coming in to check in and, uh, and start the process for unloading. But at six, when those doors open, there are I think close to 10 full-size garage doors you could take like a semi-truck into, you know, height-wise. All of those open up and all of the vendors to my knowledge, and I haven't heard any complaints, are, are really cordial and kind with each other about lining up so that everybody has access to those doors so everybody can unload. And that was really important this year, especially because there was a little bit of a cold drizzle that ran pretty much through the weekend. And uh, when it comes to loading and unloading, those of you familiar with setting up at events will know that that's, that's a pretty crucial time and, and if you're, any kind of weather shift there can really put a damper on things, but it was, just neat to see once again for this show that those doors open and just you go from an empty expo hall you know these three massive rooms to within two hours just about everybody is set up and ready to do business and and by about that eight o'clock mark you see folks slowing down a little bit and uh, and starting up conversations again with their kind of table mates with the people near them and with friends that they may have not seen over the last couple of years Not only is the Kalamazoo Living History Show a great place to catch up and meet up with friends, but Leslie and Rick set aside an entire room and develop a whole schedule of educational seminars that pertain to that year's theme. This year's theme was focused on frontier artists and naturalists, and the talks and, and seminars really covered a wide berth uh, of you know, really early American naturalists all the way up through really the end of, of what we consider the Wild West or the Old West. Um, and it was really neat to see that the speakers this year, first up we had Michael Dotson with a presentation on the prince, the artist, and the cowboy, following a European prince's funding of naturalist expeditions into, uh, into America and, and the, what would become the American West. And then a second generation Western artist as he picked up where the previous naturalists had left off, kind of covering the beginning and the end of the American West and, and the frontier, really. Then Ken Scott had a presentation on Mark Catsby and William Bartram. Again, two generations of naturalists documenting all things here in the American continent as the Europeans discovered it. From there, we had Glass Trader Beads, an overview of common types and uses in the 18th century by Ward Oles. I was fortunate enough to be able to sit by Ward for most of the weekend. Uh, it was really great hearing his expertise and him sharing his knowledge about 18th century material culture. Thanks to his willingness to answer questions from the crowd, uh, we really got into a lot more than beads, which was really interesting. From there, we had their bearing is noble and proud from James F. O'Neill and the meaning and uses of wampum by Susan Miner. I didn't have a lot of knowledge about wampum and its uses through time, but after Susan's presentation, I felt like I learned a lot. I don't know that I can dive into uh, creating any wampum pieces myself, but it was really interesting and informative.
If you've heard about this show and haven't had a chance to attend, you can really find anything and everything that you need for your muzzleloading or living history equipment. And I, I say muzzleloading and living history because it covers both. It has a foot in both worlds, really, and I think represents the median and the hybridization of both of these interests. If you're exclusively interested in muzzleloading, don't be at all put off by the living history show in the title. There are plenty of original and reproduction muzzleloaders, both mass produced and individually crafted muzzleloaders, as well as the supplies and gear uh, to use them. You now you won't find any black powder, but you can find everything else that you need for your muzzleloader. There's quite a wide variety I saw this year of muzzleloaders and muzzleloader accessories, which was really encouraging. I talked to a lot of the vendors and craftspeople there and they'd said they'd seen an uptick in interest in muzzleloading over the last couple years. And I hope to see that continue over the next few years here. On the living history side, this is a great show to come in and invest in a new impression on a new era or update and upgrade some of your equipment uh, and trade out some of your worn out stuff for maybe some newer items. If you're interested in just getting started and you don't have a large budget for your impression or for your gear, you can find a wide variety of, of quality and price points at this show. You can find affordable machine sewn items of clothing, or you can get up into really traditional, really period hand sewn items as well, and everything in between, which I think is really great. The show, you can, I keep coming back to it, but you can go and you can talk and you can learn, but you also learn about the hobby and about the community just being at this show. Because there is such a variety of the community represented at this show in one location, it's like a super mall for muzzleloading and living history in that you can just go and watch and learn and you can go and shop and learn and you can go and just catch up with old friends. It's something you'll see in a lot of shows across the country dealing in muzzleloading and living history, but I think the Kalamazoo Living History Show, at least in this area, is a really special show because of that community that it fosters. That's all I have for you today. I hope that you've enjoyed this little slice of the Kalamazoo Living History Show. I hope that you can plan it into your calendars for next year. It runs every year in Kalamazoo, Michigan at the Expo Center towards the end of March. I encourage you to put it on your calendars and, uh, and make it out if you can. If you'd like to learn more about the show or the artists and craftspeople that we've featured here in the video, I tried to feature as many of them as I could. I'm sorry if I couldn't get you into the video. But if you're interested in learning more about these artists and craftspeople and the people represented at the show, we'll have links in the description and at ilovemuzzleloading.com for you to check out. I'm Ethan. I love muzzleloading. Thank you so much for watching. We'll catch you next time.